Coming up on this week's show, Atari goes cross-platform. How you can battle cheesy DJs. And we get the history of the BBC Micro and the legendary ARM processor. This week's show is brought to you by Computer Active, the UK's best-selling fortnightly computer magazine. And The Economist, the smart guide to the forces changing your world. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 212, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to this week's podcast. Now, I do love actually that we bring the show out on a Friday. I got a little tweet the other day going, I love the fact that the Retro Hour comes out on a Friday morning. To me, that's the start of the weekend. I never even thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. A little treat before the weekend. A little treat before the weekend. Uh, you know what? A close friend of mine who... We'll still go unnamed because he never wants to be mentioned. <laughs> Joe's uh, anonymous friend. My anonymous everywhere. friend. It's just my dad. <laughs> no. uh, he always says, you know, straight away because he works from home. He listens to it on a Friday yeah, and, yeah. and he says it's his treat. Yeah. And I really like that. It's like a treat. <laughs> That's cool. So we have a little treat before the weekend. Every yeah. Friday, the Retro Hour podcast. Now, of course, we talk about everything that's been happening over the last seven days in the world of retro gaming. And we bring you a legendary guest every week. Now, I don't use the word legendary lightly when we talk about this week's guest. We're going to be joined by the father of the BBC Micro. Yeah, this is an absolutely fantastic guest. We've got Steve Ferber, and he's a pioneer. He's a computer scientist, a mathematician, and he originally worked with Acorn. Yep. He also did the amazing BBC Micro, but the Archimedes, the the ARM chip, which, you know, it's it's used in the iPhone. It's used in many devices nowadays. Pretty much any handheld device, any, any smartphone in the world got an ARM processor inside it as well. And it's great because it all came from this company who, I mean, anyone that went to school in Britain in like from the mid-80s to like the mid-90s will have used Acorn computers. Because they were like the industry standard in the education market here. So it started with like the BBC Micros. And I remember, you know, my school, I've probably talked about this on the show before, that I was the computer monitor. I was quite uh, proud of that. Then every <laughs> morning I'd have to uh, get the four BBC Micros that we had at school. And out of a big iron safe that we keep them in overnight, put them on a trolley, the big Cub CRT monitor, plug the floppy drive into the bottom and wheel them like a complete dork into the classroom so the what other kids a I must look so cool <laughs> and, and, I and the thing is I always remember when I was a kid we all knew that the Archimedes chip was amazing Yeah, like we were always told the Archimedes is great but these were kind of seen as like school computers or computers for the rich guys mm. but it's so good to see that it hasn't gone into obscurity and that it's become a standard and it's from you know a British company. So. Well, the, I mean, you talk about the Archimedes as well, and there were a lot of games that came out on platforms like the Amiga and the Mega Drive, mm. and they generally were better ports than you get on the other systems. Because, I mean, you know, you look at something like the Acorn Archimedes 3000 or the 3010, it was more powerful than other home computers that were around at the time. Yeah, I even remember Lemmings was yeah. really good on there, yeah. Yeah, some awesome stuff, and the operating system was fantastic as well. And obviously, like I said, anyone that, you know, grew up in the 80s and 90s and loved computers in Britain... Um, you'll know about the BBC Micro and the Archimedes. So we're going to get some really good stories with this week's special guest, Acorn legend Steve Ferber, coming up on the Retro Hour podcast in around 20 minutes from now. Now, of course, we love reading about computers and finding out tips. And I mean, we, we use retro systems, but we use modern systems as well. You know, we, we all have to in everyday life. And there is something that I always pick up if I'm going away on a train journey or I'm in the supermarket and I see a copy. I always like getting hold of a copy of Computer Active. Now, we're trying to work out, because you read Computer Active as well, Ravi. Yeah. I think I've read it for about 15 years. Wow. <laughs> long time, yeah. <laughs> always get a copy of it. And it's such an interesting read. Because what I like about having a magazine, having Computer Active, is... You look at like a tutorial on a website, and first of all, often you don't know who's made the tutorial, what their credentials are, and they cover so much in there too. I mean, they've got great opinion pieces that I find really interesting. The letters section is still the first place I turn to in any magazine. I used to love them, the letters yeah. at the back, but also, you know, you write about tutorials. Without mm. tutorials and magazines, I would not have my website design career yeah. now. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's so much in here as well. Recently, they've covered stuff like antivirus software, broadband, how to protect your data. They do a lot of that at the moment, you know, consumer rights and privacy, stuff that you need to know. And they offer you clear, concise advice to get the very best out of your computer. Or it could be your tablet or your smartphone or Windows or Macs. They cover loads in here as well. Now, we'd like to give you three issues of computer active in print and digital you'll get both for just one pound that's a no-brainer one pound and you get three issues of computer active now that is a huge saving on the usual shop price you'll actually save 11 pound 87 
wow. by getting three issues for the print and digital bundle. So if you subscribe today, you'll also get a free 15-piece PC repair toolkit as well as a welcome gift. And every issue will be hand-delivered to your door at no extra cost every fortnight. So we want you to give this a try. Three issues of Computer Active on us. All you've got to do is head to this website right now. And of course, you'll be really helping out our show by doing this. Get computeractive.co.uk forward slash retro hour to claim your first three issues for just a pound and your free welcome gift get computeractive.co.uk forward slash retro hour of course utari seems to be something that we're talking about every week at the moment the hotels obviously we're talking about a couple of weeks back and the atari vcs now we actually did get a message on facebook someone was like i heard you talking about the atari vcs and i was confused why you were saying it's coming out soon didn't it come out 40 years ago this is the new Atari VCS. All I can right. see where the confusion has come from. <laughs> We've had to clear this up. Yeah. <laughs> well, essentially, a company that own Atari's rights now, and if I, if I follow the trail correctly, this is Infograms, isn't it? Who are, I think now own the Atari rights. Well, essentially, it's, yeah, it, a company that a, went through the ring, yeah, the ringer. Yeah, yeah they the were the same stuff. hotel people. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, and they're bringing out a new platform, which um, it's kind of been coming for a couple of years now. We've seen the hardware. We know it exists. It's coming out soon. The Atari VCS. Now, we keep finding out new things about it all the time. We're talking about the controllers and we're talking about the design of the system and the additional things that you're going to get with it. The services they're going to be offering as well a couple of weeks ago. And now they've teamed up with another service called Wonder OS. And I think this is actually potentially quite a good idea for them to do this. So it says it's for cross, so cross-platform gaming. Yeah. So what does that mean? So Wonder OS, and I was looking a bit into this, and it's based on Android. So yeah. it's an operating system that essentially allows games to communicate with other devices. So say, for example, you've got uh, an iPhone, for example, mm-hmm. but you want to play a game on your phone against somebody who's got Android. Okay. Or you've got a Windows machine, you want to play against somebody who's got a Mac. Oh, okay. Uh, but also you could play, you know, now with the Atari VCS versus somebody who's playing on an iPhone, for example. Oh, okay. So where they were saying they've got like Fortnite yeah. running on it and stuff like that. I'm just reading a little bit more on it here. It's saying if it does actually officially come out, if they wanted to, you could potentially play the Atari VCS against somebody on PlayStation 4, for example. Yeah, if Wonder OS was on the PS4. I'm not sure it is at the I moment. I think it's but, just an Android phone. Yeah, just an Android at the moment. It's just an example. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. as an example. So, yeah. but, but what it does mean is, I mean, obviously games like that, the mobile gaming market is massive. Mm. And a lot of mobile gamers who are really into it do use like Bluetooth controllers yeah, and that kind yeah, of thing yeah. too. Yeah. And I think this does open up a much bigger potential of online gamers who can play with you if you've got an Atari VCS. And I think it's a good idea, actually, that you've essentially got more people to play with. It opens up the world a bit more. Yeah, but that also makes me worry because you can get, like, you know, PUBG and Fortnite and stuff for your mobile phone. That starts to make me worry. Is this console just going to be running those kind of versions? Mobile games. games. Well, last time we discussed the console, it was, what what did we say? It's a very nice case because it didn't have anything that was running on there like a system. Mm. Now, to me, this looks like a launcher, like like Epic launcher, like Steam, like anything else like that. I don't see any difference um, or anything. We're always so pessimistic, aren't we? (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. It's true, though. (laughs) I don't see any difference, uh, apart from you can do streaming from your PC onto it, which Mm. you you can do with a Chromecast or Stadia or uh, any of the other devices at the moment. Like Steam, Steam Link did that. Mm. ages ago so but it does have retro games and that's the difference i think that's that's good and hopefully if they can have a skin that doesn't look so androidy and looks a bit atari then you've got your I'll defend it there i think it, i think it looks nice i think it looks nice and you've got your faux wood wood grain on the front but you there. know what i mean instead yeah, of the burger menu in the corner you want to have the atari logo don't you <laughs> yeah <laughs> you, know, you want it to be a bit well I, i'm confident that their their native launcher for their games on it will look good it'll be yeah. polished i'm sure yeah. it won't just be like a mobile I, 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 space, I, i'm just glad that they've now got a launcher though that's what i mean like because before they didn't have one but now they've got one it's just it would be good to have a customized version we're obviously looking on the wonder site at the moment so we're not knowing what kind of mm deal they've done, what skins they're going to put on there, what game packages, you know. But what I think is, I mean, they're obviously teaming up with services like Antstream, they got yeah. Wonder OS on there mm. as well. We are talking last week about how the fact that it's going to be able to run Windows games on it as well. So it seems like they're actually opening this box up quite a lot. And they're not keeping it. I think, you know, the mistake, if you look at something like the Ouya made, you had one device that could run games from its store, and that's it. And if developers yeah. didn't make games for the Ouya, you wouldn't get it on it. Whereas this kind of opens up possibilities to actually use software design for other systems on it. 
Yeah, and maybe maybe they're trying to think what's going to be the most popular. We don't know yet. Like, are we going to put streaming out? Is that going to be the most popular? Is playing the game locally or playing it multiplayer with your mates? Like, how you know which one's going to kick off? So they're probably covering all bases here. And I think anyway, cross-platform gaming. The fact that it is becoming more open these days. And the fact that you can play, you know, Xbox games against PlayStation owners now, and, you know, obviously a limited way. There are not a load of games doing that. But I think bringing down these barriers and taking down those walls between platforms is a good thing. Yeah, for sure, yeah, definitely. Like, with the cross-release of uh, Xbox One titles and PC titles at the moment, you know, it's kind of getting getting standard to have uh, cross-platform gaming, yeah. Because, I mean, you're probably the same, you know, in the past, I remember buying a game and some of my mates said it on Xbox 360, others on PS3. Yeah. I had to buy two copies of the games so I could play with different sets oh, of Oh, God, mates. we're not all as rich as you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Second hand for a tenner from CX, five years after came out. But yeah, you know what I mean? It's like, it's really annoying to have to do that. Yeah. And often you find when people are picking a console, that's one thing, you know, I often get people who I work with, and oh, what console should I get my son or whatever? I also say, what, what do his mates play? Yeah, absolutely. And it'd be good if you didn't have that barrier in place, if you could yeah, play any games. Yeah, and any I think, system. you know, when PS4 and Xbox One were coming out, there was yeah. lots of rumours that barrier was going to get torn down. Yeah. But the reality of it is, I think there's, what, like two games you can do it on or something like that, so... And and I think also they've never tried this, have they? They've never tried retro streaming. They've never tried, like, you know, this is a big mm. platform with new features and stuff. So, yeah, they're going to kind of have to see where it works, whereas stuff like first-person shooters have been online for years haven't they yeah true <laughs> you know, yeah you're taking a lot of old retro games that haven't necessarily been online if you're getting some of the classic ones mm. and then adding new features so yeah we'll, we'll see what we'll see what sticks with it you know? now, the more, I'm, more i read about it though actually the more interested i am becoming in the atari vcs i'm kind of looking at it thinking well maybe if the price i know the price at launch we've talked about before if it came down a bit maybe yeah yeah one. yeah and you know you see them on the production line yeah. they're looking nice yeah absolutely so we'll keep an eye on it looking forward to seeing the release i'm actually looking forward to seeing one in person to see how it plays that's what i'm looking that's what to. i want to do get, yeah. get maybe i won't be critical if i can sit down and have a play with it for <laughs> an hour or so and then go oh this is fat you know now one thing me and joe are always critical about is um a game that we do both love but we're both absolutely terrible at we talked about this the other week, actually. Ghost and Goblins. Speak for yourself, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay, that's a challenge. <laughs> I think I, I've made it off like the first like screen like twice in my life. I've completed it, it oh, once. Oh, you have, actually. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and, and I don't think I could do it again. I'm sure you dreamt that. I never <laughs> Where, Where's the evidence? I might have to stream it one day, see if I can do it again. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you're a fan of that game, as we are, maybe you're not very good at it, but you actually want to play a new version of it, I absolutely love this. Now, there's a new game that's inspired by um, Ghosts and Goblins, and it's free. You can get it on Steam. Um, side-scrolling like the original, but this is called Ghosts and DJs. Now, right. this, is, this is set in a world <laughs> where, essentially, the world is getting taken over by really cheesy commercial DJs. Okay. And, and some of the names in there are inspired by, like, you know, David Guetta and Paris Hilton and people like that. And what you have to do, you're a guy who works in a record shop, and you're just fed up of hearing all this music that sounds the same all the time. You know, this kind of EDM kind of sound. Yeah. And he's on a mission then to go through, and you meet all these characters who are like, you know, chads, who are like, you know, like uh, <laughs> DJs that you find in Miami who play, like, you know, really cheesy commercial dance music. And you've got to go through and essentially destroy them and restore decent music back to the world. <laughs> so. It looks brilliant. I'm watching it right now. The graphics on it look amazing as well. It's really funny, and there's like a little story at the beginning. Yeah. Um, I'll link up the video in our show notes as well where you can actually see this guy like, what is this music? And his friend's talking to him, telling him about all these DJs have made it. And he goes, we must stop it, restore like the world to... Sounds like your be. ideal game, doesn't yeah. it? Does. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's actually, I mean, uh, Dr. Cucho is a house music legend from, I think he's from Spain. Um, you know, he, he's made some great house tracks over the last couple of years. And he's actually done the soundtrack to it as well. And uh, Dead Mouse is on there as well. He's yeah, stuff oh, that's cool. Because well, so. I remember all those videos coming out of like Paris Hilton DJing. And, like, a hand would appear from underneath <laughs> the mixer and start doing the DJing for her oh, while wow. she was, like, dancing with her headphones on. Crazy. Yeah, so um, I, I think we do need to take on that and re- restore some credibility to the world as well. Yeah. So this game's free. It looks really fun, actually. So I'll link that up if you want to check it out for yourself. Now, another game, actually, you used to love back in the day, Double Dragon. Yeah. The series a bit hit and miss. Some great games in it, some not so good. I've always been a fan of Double Dragon, and I'm excited for Have this. Have you played Double Dragon on the Atari Jaguar, though? No, I haven't. Don't. Oh, okay, fair (laughs) enough. I thought that was like a challenge then. So I'm excited about this one. So there's a bundle coming out, the Retro Brawlers Bundle, which is Double Dragon and Kunio Kun, which I'm butchering right now, which is a compilation which came out on February 20th. So yesterday. So yesterday. 
It's a collection of 18 retro brawlers, it says, so beat-em-ups, if you will, from the side-scrolling NES. Side-scrolling beat-em-ups. So side-scrolling yeah. beat-em-ups from the NES era, and it includes the three original Double Dragons, uh, River, City, River City Ransom, Renegade, um, just some really, really cool old-school beat-em-ups. And I think it's, you know, it's in the same vein of, like, you know, the Mega Man collection and the Castlevania collection, all of them which have all recently come out. But I've just read here that the Mega Man, the most recent Mega Man compilation that came out, the Mega Mega Man Legacy Collection sold over a million copies. Wow, okay. So there is a demand for these kind yeah, of things. Right. And, you know, and I can't imagine it's costing millions of pounds for them to just, you know, dump this on the Switch and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? So I'm pretty excited about this one, and I do want to challenge Dan to Double Dragon again. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually playing. Th- there was a new Double Dragon game on the Switch that came out last year, the year before. Was it like Double Dragon Neon or Neo or something like that? I wanna, in my mind, it's Double Dragon 5, but it's probably not. Yeah, I can't remember what it's called, but I was playing that with my little six-year-old nephew, Harry, and he loved it. He, yeah. he, didn't, he didn't want to get off it, you know. We were playing it for hours. So those games, I think they are... They kind of remind me of my childhood quite a lot because I'd always mm. play on those games that, like, you know, if I went to a friend friend's house who had a Master System or something, that would always be one of the games we'd play. But they all pick up and play games. And yeah. You can just kind of play them while you're talking. You don't have to pay too much attention yeah, to them. Yeah, exactly. Like, and you don't have to sit there waiting for them to load up and, you know what I mean? You can just jump in and play them. So, And it's, like you say, it's not often these days that you get like a compilation of these different games it's like it's all the Castlevania games or all the Contra games so it's cool to see that there's going to be like Double Dragon um, there's going to be Dodgeball on there as well and like I say Renegade uh, which was like Renegade's like one of the earliest beating ups as well so I've never played that so I'm quite looking forward to that one well also those um, Kunio Kun games in there as well apparently there's 11 games from that series yeah I'm not familiar with that well apparently they're only released in Japanese so now they're going to be translated into English for the first time ever oh wow so um, you know that looks awesome I think I do enjoy playing those games and if you've got friends over it's always like you know your Streets of Rage that's kind of yeah. game Golden Axe you just want to put amongst a good catch yeah, game absolutely. Think, so I'll be picking that up for the Switch Ravi however likes a slightly darker game <laughs> now Kingpin was that a favourite of yours back in the day? Yeah actually this was the changing point for me when I, I was I was playing on Amigas god damn it and then I went <laughs> went to this event and they had a Unreal Tournament mm. running on one and then Kingpin running on the other and I was like this is the darkest game I've ever played <laughs> um, it was based on the Quake 2 engine yeah. yeah but the idea was you were a gang seeking revenge and oh. um, you'd you'd get into safe cracking yeah so you get your guys going around you'd all crack safes and then you'd get like higher grade of weapons but these weapons would be like a stick with nails in it nice and then you'd go and take <laughs> on the enemies it was really good actually um, it was uh, 3D Realms yeah, and that, um, was it 99 it came out? So yeah, yeah. Over 20 years ago now. Well, actually, the reason we're talking about it is Kingpin Reloaded um, is coming out very soon on Steam. So what they've done is, because obviously 3D Realms Well, actually, they're saying PC Switch as well. Switch, Switch, right, which okay. is shocking, because this is going to be the most gory game on the <laughs> Switch possible. So it's coming to the Switch as well. Wow. Okay, yeah, yeah, Xbox oh. One and PS4 as well. Well, that's really good. I was just looking at it, and I was like, this does look quite cool, and this is... This is not one I've heard of. It's so. like Manhunt before Manhunt <laughs> existed if, without the crazy killings, but it's a fantastic game. Well, they're saying some of the stuff, I mean, the Steam version here is a 4K, 60 frames a second. They've really updated that classic Quake 2 engine, um, ultra-wide screen support too, um, really enhanced graphics, have reskinned everything, a new quest system in there too. Yeah. Everything's been enhanced and polished L- up. Looking for the enhancements in this, when I played the original yeah. game, it was very dark. Mm-hmm. And it was always, you know, bang your contrast and brightness up to try and, oh, yeah. <laughs> try and see what's what going on. So I think they've fixed up the dynamic lighting and stuff. And everywhere looks like a bit more well lit and the characters are probably lit a lot better. But they still, they've got that chunky Quake 2 style. Yeah, you yeah. Know? yeah. <laughs> Square heads and everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I never played that game back in the day. Um, but the fact that it's coming out on Switch is really interesting. It kind of seems like Nintendo are getting a bit more relaxed now about what comes out on their They platform. really are, yeah. yeah. That, that would not be coming out on the Wii U, would it? <laughs> That's the thing. I mean, even like, you know, the Doom that came out, Doom 2016 that came out on, on the Switch, that's quite a brutal game as well. But then I played one actually, I, I like, totally take that back. I played one called Devil's Third, which you had to escape a prison on the Wii U, and that was brutal. As well. Actually, I've got a few games on the Wii U that are pretty dark, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. I think, you know, as somebody's coming into it with fresh eyes, it's not a game that oh, I've played before. Fantastic so, game, yeah, yeah, really good. Looks, I, I'm looking forward to it. Pre order that. Well, the fact the 3D realms are back as well. Oh, yeah. You know, love, loving their releases recently. Now, something else that we've, um, we've actually done an episode about on the podcast before, um, a couple of really popular episodes, and we've actually had people who the story's about on the podcast in the past, Console Wars. Yes, yes. So we've had a Blake J. Harris, yeah. the actual author, 
of Console Wars on this podcast. And there's two things that are happening. So there's two films. There's a Console Wars documentary that's currently going on. Okay. And that is what we're talking about that's going to be released. But then there's a TV series which is being filmed at the moment with uh, Seth Rogen, yep. but also the director of Pineapple Express. So, so the director that's worked with him on all the previous kind of really, really hit, funny Seth Rogen films. And uh, this is going to be the story of the war between Nintendo Japan uh, and Sega Japan and Sega America and the kind of oh, wow. chaos that happened there. Now, obviously it's about, it starts with the story of Tom Kalinske. Yeah. We've had Tom on the show before, um, former president of Sega. And it kind of goes through, Look, it's like a narrative here as well, a lot of interviews and talks about the history of the competition between Sega and Nintendo, which in the late 80s and early 90s, and I think that probably still is the most brutal console war. That's ever happened. Yeah, I don't. You don't really. Obviously, you've got like PlayStation, and Xbox, and stuff, but it wasn't like it was back then. You know, you didn't. You rarely get across people who are actually going to get into an argument or over. a physical fight. Yeah, I mean, actually, a physical fight. Or and and like Sega, like, Sega themselves were pitched against each other, weren't they? It yeah. was America yeah. versus Japan. Like, how can you release a Sega Saturn? without the Americans even knowing that that was in existence. Yeah, and, then, and then they're like, oh, we've got a 32X. And it's like, yeah. what's going on? You know? So absolute yeah. crazy time in gaming, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the reason we're talking about it is because Console Wars, the movie, is actually getting its premiere next month. Oh, wow. That's going to be premiering at South by Southwest okay. in America. Um, and they reckon the movie's going to be released next month as well. So hopefully we won't be long until we can check so, it out. So I think this is the actual documentary. It's called Console Wars, the movie. And yeah. then they're going to have... There's a series like, as well. They're, they're going to have the series, yeah, mm-hmm. which will be on netflix yeah so really hyped for that i mean i I think you were the first person to tell me about that when you read the book yeah years ago so also we have blake on i mean if you want to check out the episode we did with tom Kalinsky and blake yeah and seth if you're listening and you want to come on just uh, (laughs) drop me a tweet yeah we'd love to have seth rogan on that'd be awesome he's really into like his nintendo stuff and everything isn't he? yeah yeah totally he's like he's taken this book and he's actually been touting this around you know he's it's like a personal project of him to actually get console wars out there as a tv series i love it when you get like you know like famous vips who love like retro gaming and that and it it feels like they're just like down to earth normal guys then when you hear yeah it makes them them quite real doesn't it like they they go home and chill on the xbox you you know they were getting frustrated on the same mario (laughs) level as you you know actually speaking of vips is it time to roll out the red carpet and give a shout to this week's VIPs who've made the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Now, every week on the podcast, as a big thank you for your support, we give you a mention on the very prestigious Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Now, getting on the Hall of Fame could not be easier, could it, Joe? Oh, God, now you're testing me. <laughs> Sorry. Come I on, I know, I know it's been a few weeks. Surely you haven't forgot. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't expecting that. And you, I'm just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Come on, don't panic. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, it's been a few weeks and I'm panicking. So you go on to www.theretrohour.com. There's a donate, sorry, there's a supporters That's button. The <laughs> there's a supporters button in the top right corner uh, and you can jump on there and you can donate to us, uh, which helps go into the running of the show via PayPal. Or you could even donate to charity as well. But every single penny does go straight back into the running of the show. And of course, you will get a mention on a future episode as a big thank you for your support. Just like this week, thank you, Jeremy Shaw. Renzo Leon, Neil Geldard, and Ismail Gull, who all made donations into the running of the podcast. And if you'd like to do the same, we'd really, really appreciate that. And we'll give you a mention very soon, theretrohour.com. Now, let's talk about another big supporter of the podcast. Of course, our very good friends at The Economist. We love The Economist. And in fact, we love The Economist so much, we'd like to give you your own free print copy. And it's something that's needed more than ever in the world that we live in today. Now, The Economist has been a trusted source of intelligence for over 170 years. Well established. And today, they cover so much in there as well. They help you prepare for what's going on in the world, sift through all that noise that's out there on social media, online, and focus on the essential information and tell you the real story in a time when facts matter more than ever. And they cover a lot in there as well that's going to affect your everyday life. The economy, finance... Loads of subjects like world politics, business, science, technology, the arts, video games. And every week on the show, we look through something in The Economist that we found really interesting this week. Yeah, so we'd mentioned before about facial recognition and ways to kind of change and prevent that. Well, there's a new thing that's come out, which is absolutely insane. People can now be identified at a distance because of their heartbeat. What? (laughs) Yeah, so this system's called Jettison. And uh, basically, you're able to measure from 200 metres away... Uh, the kind of minute vibrations 
even in the clothing. Through your clothes. So that if you were looking at someone's clothing, you so would be able like to see it. Metal Gear Solid. Yeah. <laughs> like... <laughs> that is crazy. I mean, that's the thing when we've been reading these articles in The Economist recently, we had the facial recognition thing you talked yeah. about as well. It's just like, you know, the, the way the world's going now, it's important that you know about this stuff. Yeah, so it's a new technology. They're actually calling it the heart print. Right. Everyone's got an individual heart print there. Yeah, yeah. It reminds crazy. me of that episode of Red Dwarf with cats when his heart was. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, you can read about this kind of thing in The Economist and much more as well. And we want you to get your own free copy of it. So if you live in the UK, grab your phone right now. You'll be really helping out this podcast by doing it. Just text the word retro and send that to 78070 and you will get your free copy of The Economist dropping through your letterbox on us. So that's retro to 78070 with The Economist, the smart guide to the forces changing your world. Now, before we chat to this week's special guest about the history of the BBC Micro, the ARM processor that's in everything now, Steve Ferber is coming up in just a minute. Before we do that, though, let's do our retro picks. Now, this is things that we've been looking at this week, things that we've loved in the world of retro in the last seven days. And I've been watching a really good YouTuber. Now, he's a guy I've watched for probably about a year. And his channel's actually getting pretty big now. Now, (laughs) I will admit, I don't quite know how to pronounce his name. Okay. I think it's (laughs) Akbakuku. A-K- I think it's how you say it. <laughs> A-K-B-K-U-K-U. Yeah, Ak- I think you did pretty Ak-B-Kuku. good there. Uh, well, his channel's called Tech Tangents. He recently renamed it, so you know people can actually pronounce it. But he's got a really cool channel, and he covers the kind of stuff that I find really interesting. Just really out there weird stuff, like using a Nintendo Power Glove on Windows 98. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's a video I did recently. But he's done some really weird stuff. Like he's setting up a mainframe in his house at the moment, and there'll be a mainframe. And it's just videos like that that are like just so stuff you don't see everywhere, you know, that are completely different. And a lot of his videos are just like, you know, puts a camera on and does it. Some of them are like an hour long. Mm. And he's got one, I think it's done like three million views or something. Oh, wow. Building like his ultimate Windows 98 um, DOS rig or something. It's, it's a really interesting video anyway. And there's loads of different stuff on there. It looks cool because he's got like typewriters, turntables, all, all kinds of different technology in there as well. Well, he's just done an hour long video on a portable adding machine from from back back (laughs) in the 60s so if you love like if you're like me and you really love this kind of nerdy stuff and he he does hi-fis and that kind of thing you know if you like channels like tech moan or drugger one is really interesting too um you love tech tangents i'll link that up in our show notes as well what about you ravi what's your pick yeah so this is a great site vintage is the new old and basically they do articles on that and they're really nice detailed articles they've got one about the spectrum next coming out as well and about the updates that have kind of been dropped on it but also they've got the one thing that we've been asking for for a long time still check our events section but they've put up an events calendar which is fantastic because i've always wondered we've got so many events going on all around the world and you know you kind of want to have one central place where they're all put and uh, they've already got the vcf stuff so they've got a lot of the american stuff and hopefully they're going to be adding a few of the UK and European events as well. So if you want to find a retro show near you, it's a good yeah. place to look. What have you been looking at this week? Uh, just a YouTuber, a little one, uh, a guy called Pat Mann, so that's P-A-T Mann Q-C, uh, who's the history of arcade game documentaries. Oh, cool. So he just does nice little 10-minute videos about arcades, and what I really like about him is he covers a lot of those arcades, you know, which never got a home port, like the Spider-Man arcade machine, uh, the second Golden Axe game, the official kind of like arcade version of that and stuff. He's a South American guy so uh, uh, sorry he's um from the southern states of america so right. he's not south american um and i just really like his accent it's quite it's quite funny and I he's just, got that southern american draw yeah yeah <laughs> big time uh and it, yeah you know you know me i just like my my simple videos about arcade <laughs> games and stuff so yeah he just covers them so i thought i'd give him a shout out joe works long hours he's got to unwind after yeah work, exactly so absolutely <laughs> so if you want to check out any of our retro picks and everything else we talked about in this week's show you'll find them all on our website at the retrohour.com and uh, speaking of events as well play expo coming up of course on the 9th and 10th of may can't believe it's only like a few months away now <laughs> utah saints <laughs> now the reason you're saying that is of course we had the utah saints on the podcast last month yeah they're actually going to be joining us on stage at play expo yeah i oh, can't wait for so, that it's going to be great and you know there's so many people going are they gonna do a dj set we'll hope so we'll see <laughs> well i mean obviously they worked on a lot of games in the past i mean the wipeout series have worked on fifa um we did an interview with them on the podcast that you can check out they've um, got, even got a golden joystick they have tim from the utah saints has got a games master golden joystick and they were involved in the launch of the Philips cdi as well which is a crazy story so if you want to come along and check out the utah set 
Utah Saints Live and uh, much more that's going to be happening at Play Expo Manchester tickets are on sale now we'll be on stage all weekend uh, hosting the talks as well you can get your tickets by heading to playexpomanchester.com now let's get into the history of legendary systems like the BBC Micro the Acorn Archimedes with this week's special guest Steve Ferber <laughs> You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it's time to welcome on this week's very special guest, a true veteran of the British computer industry, talking about systems like the BBC Micro, the ARM processor that's in like pretty much every handheld device today. Let's welcome to the podcast Steve Ferber. Hello, Steve. Hi, how are we doing? Yeah, very good, thank you. Now, uh, before we get into the story of those systems, I know that you um, you grew up in Manchester. What was it that originally got you into technology then as a young man? I, uh, at school, I, I enjoyed mathematics and, and, and I seemed to have some kind of ability um, in maths. So when I went to university, I, I, I went up to, to study mathematics as, a, as the easy option as far as I was concerned. Um, and in, in the course of, of, of my student life, I got increasingly interested in bits of technology. I was a bit of a, a model aeroplane enthusiast as a teenager, mm. and, and so I'd always had an interest in flying, and, and, and I began to think about flight simulators. And then I heard about these guys who were forming a student society that, that built computers for fun, and I thought that would be a good way into flight simulators. So, re- so really, uh, flying was my route into technology at university. And so when you went to university, you kind of got more into computing. What was your exposure to machines then? During the maths course, there was a little bit of exposure. The, the, the Cambridge University Maths Department had uh, a Modular One computer, um, which is a fairly antique piece of kit. I think the, the, it used um, HP storage oscilloscopes. Uh, so you could sort of draw vectors on the storage screen and then you could flash erase the whole screen and start again. And you could program this modular one to do uh, uh, various fairly basic things. But my main memory of the maths course is that uh, uh, I I made myself a a Sinclair scientific calculator. And actually, I didn't need a calculator in a maths course. At no point did the maths course degenerate into actual numbers. Um, The whole course was effectively symbolic. So apart from this exposure to the modular one, uh, there was very little exposure to technology as part of my undergraduate course. Um, all, all my exposure was uh, through student societies and, and, and doing things for fun. Well, that was the Cambridge Processor Group that you were in. Yeah, the CUPG, Cambridge University Processor Group. And, and I was not a founder, um, but I did go to its foundation meeting and, and I, I knew the founders quite well and, and uh, was quite an enthusiastic uh, member of the group. Well, how did you meet Herman Hauser and Chris Currier then, and what was your first impression of them? The meeting with, I think it was Herman initially, um, was uh, uh, he'd talked to Chris about where they could get some people to do some technical work. They were thinking of starting a company, and, and they'd heard about the Cambridge University Processor Group. So I think maybe Herman had been along to a meeting or so um, and identified a few people to talk to, and he invited himself round to my office in the engineering department at Cambridge um, to come and talk to me and entice me to join this uh, this new commercial activity they were setting up. And, and uh, so I met Herman first. And then I think not long after that, there was a meeting um, in the Fort St. George pub on Midsummer Common uh, between uh, Herman, Chris Curry, uh, myself and Chris Turner. Herman and Chris wanted to start this company and they were, they were talking to Chris and me about uh, how we got some of the technical work going. Obviously, uh, Chris was working with Sinclair before that. Um, did you have anything to do with them and were they kind of a big deal in Cambridge at that point? Chris was still working with, with Sinclair at the time of this meeting. Um, I think uh, one of the first things I did was hand-built a prototype of the Science of Cambridge MK14 and Science of Cambridge was the company that Chris Curry and Clive Sinclair had set up to to sell sort of personal home computer kits. So yes, I did have some involvement, although I'm not sure that I've ever met Clive Sinclair at all in person. Clearly they were uh, very much around in Cambridge at the time. And, and in my days at Acorn, uh, I think we rather mistakenly saw Sinclair as the, as the principal competition. Um, I think that was probably 
a significant strategic mistake to uh, see the main competition as being down the road in Cambridge rather than uh, halfway around the world in California. I mean, what did you think of Sinclair's um, computers? Well, we at Acorn thought they were, um, they'd gone a bit too far in, in the cost reduction exercise. We felt that some of the techniques they'd used to keep costs down actually uh, compromised the reliability and usability of the machines a bit too much. Well, in those early days when you were working with um, Herman and Chris, you were working on um, processes for fruit machines, is that correct? Yes. I mean, I, I was... My day job was still at the university, um, so uh, this was a kind of sideline moonlighting activity um, where I did little bits of design work for them and uh, they supplied me with parts to feed my hobby. But yes, we, we built a, a fruit machine controller. Um, it was just the time when uh, the fruit machine manufacturers were uh, wanting to move from electromechanical control systems to microprocessors and, and we produced a design for a dual processor national semiconductor SCMP controller. We were doing the fruit machine controller um, and uh, Sophie Wilson got involved. Her main contribution w was to prevent the fruit machine from paying out when somebody used an electronic cigarette lighter close to the cash um, <laughs> entry slot. People had discovered with this newfangled electronic control it was fairly easy to make a mess of it by injecting high voltages such as those you get from the igniter on an electronic cigarette lighter. And, and uh, Sophie built a, an FM radio receiver which detected uh, any such activity and immediately shut the fruit machine down. So the one thing you could be sure was that it would not pay out if you attempted to do this. But uh, as I said, I, I hand-built the prototype of the Science of Cambridge MK14 and, and Sophie looked at this and said, um, I can do better than that and went home over the Easter holiday and, and came back with a small, similar prototype machine, this time based around the 6502 microprocessor, which Sophie called the Hawk, and Acorn uh, commercialized as the System 1. And in fact, Acorn was initially just a trading name for that side of the business. Uh, the, the company itself was called Cambridge Processor Unit Limited, CPU Limited. Um, but... Uh, uh, fairly rapidly after that, the hobbyist computer side took over and, and, and the company became Acorn. Where did the name Acorn come from then? I've read varying <laughs> different stories about that. Oh, well, I think the, the, these, these things are all of legend. Um, the thing I vaguely remember was the idea that coming earlier in the phone book than Apple was a good idea. Um, and it's, you know, it's another sort of fruit, uh, but it's earlier alphabetically than Apple. <laughs> But I don't, I don't know if that's true. I don't know where it came from. Yeah, you forget how important the phone book was back then, though, don't you? Yeah. Yes, I, I can hear the younger audience saying, what's a phone book? <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, they had the Acorn Atom as well, which was a kit computer. And I mean, kind of back then, were micro seen a bit like ham radios almost for like electronics hobbyists at that stage? And what were people actually using them for? I think they were using them to learn about the technology. Um, the, the, the Acorn System 1, like the MK14, it uh, was uh, a small circuit board with the hexadecimal keypad and a hexadecimal display. Um, and you could enter programs tediously in hexadecimal and get them to run. Um, and of course, the Acorn System 1 famously appeared on the central control column in the Blake 722nd century space cargo ship on the BBC, I think it was. But the, the, the Atom uh, was the first attempt by Acorn to put uh, what today you recognize as a keyboard into the machine. And, and yes, up to that point, Acorn's uh, machines were sold as kits. And so they were really only bought by people who knew which end to pick up a soldering iron. Um, and that's quite a small market. It was in the course of, of, of the Atom, and, and I didn't have any significant involvement in the Atom itself. Um, but in the course of the Atom sales, uh, that Acorn made the transition from selling kits to selling finished product because we realized that uh, uh, requiring soldering skills was, was limiting the market severely. And uh, some of the atoms that came back uh, for repair uh, clearly illustrated that we'd, uh, uh, we'd outgrown the market of, of, of home solderers. Uh, the classic example was a machine that came back with, with a note saying that uh, the, the person who bought it knew that 
heat was bad for microchips, so instead of soldering the chips into the circuit board, they glued them all in, but the computer still didn't work. Um, at that point, we thought, well, yes, that's it. Um, we better start assembling these things. Well, you mentioned the BBC then uh, with Blake 7, but um, when did they kind of get involved and what was the initial plan with the BBC Micro? The BBC, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I'm, I'm not that good on dates, but I'm fairly sure it was early... 1981 that Chris Curry picked up the rumor that the BBC was um, looking to base a series of TV programs on a particular computer and they'd been working I think with Newbury Newbrain for some time but were beginning to lose confidence and wanted to open up um, the possibility of adopting a different machine. Um, at that time the Atom was going quite nicely and uh, we'd sketched out a design for a, a development of that, um, which was internally known as the Proton, which was a dual processor system. So using an 8-bit microprocessor for the front end and uh, some 16-bit processor probably for the back end, though that was not well defined. And uh, when the BBC invited Acorn to bid into the BBC contract and said they were going to come and visit, uh, the, the Proton was rapidly rushed through and, and, and hand-assembled within a week uh, so that we had a prototype to show the BBC when they came on a visit. Now, the prototype we showed them was not the full dual processor. It was the front-end 8-bit computer, and, and that was necessary to try and approach their, their price point. Uh, but, of course, the BBC Micro always had this tube interface to allow a second processor to be plugged in externally. You mentioned then about the BBC coming to look at it. I mean, is that story true in, um, in Micro Men, where they're literally like running up the stairs and the machine wasn't working until they almost got in the room? It, it's, it's, of course, somewhat exaggerated for dramatic effect. I think we did get the machine to, beginning to work about three hours before they arrived rather than three minutes afterwards as portrayed in Micro Men. But the, you know, the final tweak that made it work that's shown in Micromen is, is, is quite accurate, that Herman, who had really no idea what was going on technically at all, uh, suggested we cut this wire, which I think was an earth connection. I don't think it was a clock wire, but I'm not sure. And we were very tired. We'd been effectively working day and night for several days. Um, and, and this was a stupid idea. There was no reason at all why it should work, but we'd run out of other ideas, so we did it. And lo and behold, the machine uh, leapt into life and started functioning. That must have felt like divine intervention or something had just made it work. <laughs> something like that. I mean, in, in Micro Men, I think they did quite a nice job of, of making it look like a, a bomb disposal scene. But uh, <laughs> uh, I, I found that quite funny. Well, you had a kind of lot of competition going for it, including Sinclair. How did you ensure your design was the best? Oh, I, I don't think we had any way of ensuring our design was the best. We just we just did the best job we knew how to do. And we're talking about very early prototypes. And, and I think uh, Clive Sinclair had probably already upset the BBC quite a lot by having by rather assuming that he should get the business. And, and I, I think they were impressed by what Acorn could put together with a week's notice. I mean, when they came, on one hand, they had the, the case mock-up, so they knew what it would look like. That was put together by Alan Boothroyd. And on the other hand, they had um, a functioning prototype on the bench showing what it would work like. And I think they were appropriately impressed by what Acorn could do in under a week. But I don't know that. You'd, you'd have to ask them that. Were there any disagreements with what the BBC wanted and when, when they were like talking about you know, the specs of the machine and what you guys at Acorn were designing? Was there any kind of cross opinions there and things he had to change? Well, the, the, their basic spec was, was for a Z80 machine running CPM. And what we offered them was a 6502 machine running a proprietary operating system. Um, so there wasn't a, a, an exact match <laughs> of, 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 of spec at the outset. Uh, of course, we did ultimately deliver the Z80 running CPM through the second processor route, but that was um, not a particularly popular expansion. And, and through the development of, of the BBC Micro, I think there was, there was quite a lot of constructive tension, uh, creative tension, uh, between the Acorn team and the BBC team on the spec. But but overall, I think it, it, it worked rather well to produce a machine that was that was really quite accomplished. 
and and uh, the BBC had uh, pretty high expectations of, of, of particularly of things such as the basic interpreter that would run on the machine but also it was their requirement that the machine should be able to uh, generate a Prestel like display which I think was mode 7 mm -hmm. um, and that required a special chip running at a frequency which was not a convenient multiple of all the other clocks around I had a very interesting circuit to produce something that looked like 6 megahertz derived from 16 so so there was a lot of input from the BBC into the spec of the machine but ultimately the machine um, was was much closer resembling what Acorn offered than what BBC thought it wanted. I thought mode 7 was interesting as well, because, I mean, like, like I said, that was very different to the other modes on the machine. Um, and also, I mean, uh, I guess a byproduct of that was that it was compatible with the Teletext standard as well. I mean, was, was that kind of in their spec, or was that just a, a happy coincidence? No, that, that was part of the spec, mm -hmm. um, was that the machine should support Teletext um, t type displays. Of course, it also had the advantage of only using a kilobyte of memory, so you had 15 or 31 kilobytes left for your program and data, which was significantly more than you got in the other display modes. Um, but uh, but I think they really wanted the machine to, to sort of integrate with their television world as far as possible. And of course, this was before the internet, um, and, and the Teletext box was used uh, amongst other things to download tele software so it was used as a as an extensive software distribution mechanism particularly for educational software to schools so yes that was an important feature then in hindsight is there any things that you would change about the design if you were kind of given more time i think overall the bbc micro turned out very well i'm not convinced it really deserved to um because it was designed in a big hurry some of the components uh, were very marginal in terms of um, operating close to or even outside the edge of their specification. It, what, one of the classic features of the machine was with, with the, an early prototype circuit board. I discovered it worked reliably if I put my finger in the right place across the back of the circuit board. But if I took my finger away, it stopped working. And, and in the final product, um, there was a, a resistor pack with eight resistors in acting as pull-ups on the processor data lines that replaced my finger because I didn't have enough fingers <laughs> to go around. Um, but we never knew why, you know, we never knew why that was necessary. Um, uh, it, it was just a, a bit of experimentation that found the right resistor value. Um, the, the other sort of interesting hardware mystery were the uh, the, the chips we used to drive the DRAM, which were National Semiconductor 81 or S95 sort of multiplexer buffer chips, uh, tri-state buffers they were. Um, and other manufacturers produced chips with identical specs, but they would never work. We plugged them into the board and the machine just didn't work. We put the National Semi chips in and it did. Weird. And we never knew why. So there were things like that that, that were a source of concern for a very long time. You know, all it required was the NAT semi production line to vary slightly and produce 81 less 95s that were more like the other manufacturers' chips, and uh, we'd have had hundreds of thousands of micros not working. Another aspect of, of the marginality was if you heated the BBC micro up to about 35 degrees C, it would stop working quite badly. Uh, so when we took our lessons from the BBC micro with, with the ARM based machines, um, they would work reliably over 100 degrees C, come what may. Uh, we really learnt about how to build good engineering margins into the designs. I mean, with the early machines, the, the, the critical issue was the power supply. Um, the BBC initially insisted on us using linear mode power supplies. Frankly, there wasn't the room in the case to make a linear supply big enough to do the job properly. And I think we had a couple of them actually catch fire as a result of these linear supplies overheating. That problem went away uh, when eventually the BBC was persuaded to allow us to go to switch mode. Because of course switch mode supplies are much more efficient and therefore dissipate much less heat in proportion to the power they output to the circuit board. And, and Aztec in Hong Kong designed the switch mode supply and once we got that in then that problem completely went away. And, and uh, I've been to the occasional retro meeting in the last few years, 
And what I discover is if you have an old BBC micro, everything tends to work except the capacitors in the power supply dry out, the electrolytic capacitors. Mm. So if you replace those capacitors, then the machine will be good for another 10 years. Well, Sophie Wilson's basic interpreter was extremely powerful. And I mean, from memory, I think you could even mix in machine code as well. I mean, was it seen as really important to have a good implementation of basic on the machine? Oh, yes, that, that was negotiated with the BBC. I mean, the BBC had, had quite firm views about, about the features they wanted in the language. Um, and Sophie uh, built on that and, and, and extended it even further. Uh, but yes, the inline assembly code was, was, was a strength. It was quite a sophisticated interpreter. It, it didn't um, simply plow through the plain text. It did all sorts of optimizations under the hood to improve performance. And, and for a long time, it, it was my favorite prototyping language. Well, there were lots of kind of revolutionary things about the BBC Micro, and the tube interface was absolutely amazing, being able to add co-processors. I, I believe people are even doing it with Raspberry Pis at the moment. Um, where did that idea come from? Well, that idea can be traced back to the Proton, the, the, the precursor to the BBC Micro. Um, we had this idea for a dual processor, um, and, and we had to cut it down to the, just the front end uh, for cost reasons for the BBC Micro, uh, but we retained the, bu- the dual processor capability. And yes, it turned out to be very powerful because we could plug a range of different second processors in. I've, I've mentioned the Z80, um, but we had a National Semiconductor 32016 second processor, which formed the basis of the, of the Cambridge Scientific Workstation, I think it was called, um, and we could use it for prototyping all sorts of other systems. And, and the early ARM systems were, were BBC Micro second processors. It was a very easy way to bring up a new processor system and, and explore its capabilities um, without having to uh, design all the sort of complications of real-time I.O. on the new processor. You could run those on the old BBC Micro um, and just get the, the new processor running um, large-scale code to explore its capabilities. But did you pay any attention to the gaming scene at all? Were you uh, often caught playing Elite or something like that? <laughs> I, I've, I've never been a particularly enthusiastic gamer. There were, there were a few games on the BBC Micro that did catch my attention. Of course, Elite was, was magnificent, mm. uh, a real step up in computer gaming and, and just staggering what David Braben managed to do with so little resource. But, of course, I, I told you I got into technology through an interest in flying, uh, so my earliest game game love was it was I think it was called Aviator, which was a a simulation a wireframe simulation of flying a Spitfire, and I I enjoyed doing that. I could fly it inverted under the bridge and do a loop around the bridge. So that was almost closing closing the loop for me, uh, delivering uh, a quite a reasonable flight simulator on the BBC Micro, um, and there was another game that I probably spent too much time playing, and that was Defender, which I can visualize, but <laughs> I, I, I can't tell you much about it. It was a, it was a kind of 2D um, shoot 'em up flying game of some sort. I love Defender, but I was never very good at it. I was awful. I, I lost it about 10 seconds, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, when did you realize just how big of a success the system had become? Because I know it obviously really outperformed the initial expectations of how many it'd sell. Yes, the... the Initial expectation, the BBC reckoned we should sell 12,000 machines based on the programs. And, of course, we ended up selling one and a half million BBC micros and, and, and early derivatives. Um, I think we realized, we, we, we began to realize that, that uh, the market was much bigger than anybody anticipated. When we were invited to give a seminar, Chris Turner Sophie Wilson and I gave a seminar at the IET in London. And the IET had a big lecture theatre, I think, with about 700 seats. And we turned up at this. And, and people had hired coaches from Birmingham to come and hear about the BBC Micro. In fact, so many people turned up that I think two-thirds of them had to be sent home uh, for health and safety reasons because they just couldn't fit them in the room. And, and that sort of event told us that you know, the, the, the pent-up public interest in computing was much stronger um, than most people realised. And the BBC Micro uh, 
was the right machine at the right time to, to satisfy a decent chunk of that demand. Of course, Sinclair also sold a lot of machines. In fact, he sold more machines than, than were sold BBC Micros. Uh, it wasn't just the BBC Micro, but I think for a certain class of customer, probably people who, who were looking for a brand they thought they could trust, uh, the BBC label on the BBC Micro was, was very reassuring and, and uh, established a very significant market for it. And, you know, being at schools and uh, at homes, it also spawned a whole generation of computer programs and enthusiasts. I even remember in the 90s, it turned to IT and all that programming was kind of lost. Um, were you really proud of that impact? Of course, yes. I think that was the most important impact of, of the whole exercise. I, I still meet people who, who say that they had a BBC Micro back in the 80s and it it changed their career for them. That's where they learned to program and so on. Um, and I, I think the machine did have a huge influence on a lot of people uh, and did make a significant contribution to um, giving the UK population a reasonable grounding um, in, in basic computer technology. Uh, I think that was its, its most important contribution and, it, and its most lasting. And in some sense, the UK games industry, which is, continues to be very successful, um, grew out of that. Of course, not just the BBC Micro, although quite a lot of people much preferred building their games on the Beebs than, than on the other products around at the time. Um, you know, because the keyboard was a bit nicer to use and would take a bit more of a hammering and so on. I mean, you mentioned stuff like that, you know, the really nice keyboard that it had, and it always felt a bit more like a of a premium product than like the cheaper home systems like, you know, companies like Commodore and Sinclair were releasing at the time. Was there always like a, like a rule that you didn't want to cut corners and um, you didn't want to bring the price down to that point? Well, we'd have loved to bring the price down, and of course we did try with the Electron mm -hmm. um, to produce a BBC compatible machine at a lower price point but even with the electron we retained a high quality keyboard uh, we compromised on a, a few other matters and we tried to achieve most of the cost reduction uh, through higher levels of integration um, using a bigger for anti ula uh, to try and put most of the non-processor and memory system functions onto a single chip so we did get the the chip count of the bbc micro which was 102 down to about 14 in the Electron. Um, but we were never happy with uh, with the cheaper keyboards that were available at that time. I think uh, industry had not yet worked out how to produce usable keyboards at a very low cost point. And so you had the choice between either having a fairly nasty keyboard um, or spending a lot of money on it. And, and we always preferred the second route because we, we saw the keyboard as a very important interface component so, so we were sensitive to quality we were we were sensitive to things like reliability and performance as well so we you know the bbc micro was if it had a fault it was it was too expensive but it was expensive for a reason i was thought with the electron as well so now I, I like the electron I actually got a couple of them still i thought they were good machines but i know they probably didn't meet the the market performance acorn hoped they would any idea why that was? Do you think the lack of BBC branding on there had, had an effect on that? Uh, no, I think it, it's a fairly simple story um, that in, in uh, the year we tried to produce the Electron, which I think was 83, we couldn't get the, the ULA that had most of the system on it operating reliably enough. Um, we had all sorts of reliability problems. And so we couldn't hit that Christmas market. If we'd hit that Christmas market then the machine would have sold in volume and, and been very successful. But we couldn't hit that, uh, we couldn't get the reliability issues sorted then. The following year, when we, did, when we did have the reliability issues under control, it was too late. Effectively, the market had moved on and Acorn was left with a warehouse with quarter of a million electrons in that it couldn't sell. So the electron was uh, one of the significant contributors to uh, the company's ultimate downfall and, and need to be rescued by Olivetti. Well, how did, you know, in those kind of glory years when the BBC Micro was flying high, I mean, how did that success change the company? Oh, it just, it just grew um, incredibly rapidly um, from when I finally joined full time, which, I, which was October 81, which was, you know, halfway through the BBC development programme. It was probably about 30 people. And two years later, it was about 400. 
so it obviously had to move to new premises. It moved from the centre of Cambridge out to Cherry Hinton, um, recruited lots and lots of people, started developing things in all sorts of different directions, um, and went from being a sort of small startup to being a medium-sized enterprise with all the issues that come with that. How did the work on the BBC Micro lead to development of the ARM processor? The connection there is is really quite strong. I think because the BBC Micro turned out so successful, the, the technical team at Acorn began to kind of feel they got the Midas touch and that, that anything we set our hand to, uh, we could probably make work. And we were looking to, to develop a successor to the BBC Micro. The obvious choice at the time was one of the 16-bit microprocessors coming onto the market, but we didn't like them. And we had technical reasons for not liking them. And there were two problems. Firstly, um, their real-time performance was poorer than the 6502 in the Beeb. So you couldn't use them to handle very flexible software-controlled I.O. as we did on the Beeb. And the second problem was that uh, the most expensive component of a personal computer was the memory. And the way to get the best value out of the memory was to maximize the bandwidth you used. And these 16-bit microprocessors couldn't keep up with the memory. They couldn't exploit the bandwidth that the customer paid for. So we were worrying about these technical aspects when um, Herman started dropping papers on our desk about this new idea from California called the Reduced Instruction Set Computer, RISC, or RISC. And we looked at these, and, 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 and to us at that time, designing a microprocessor was a bit of a black art. It was done by big semiconductor companies who spent vast fortunes, and you know, National Semiconductor was at Rev-G or Rev-H of the 32016, and they still hadn't got the bugs out. But then here, here was this postgraduate class at UC Berkeley that had produced a competitive microprocessor in a year, and it worked first time. So we began to think if we took these risk ideas and combined them with our past experience of building systems, and it particularly was Sophie Wilson who knew a lot about how to build high-level languages and interpreters. If we poured that experience into a risk machine, you know, maybe we could produce something competitive. Those were the ideas that were going through our heads in, in, in 1983 when Sophie and I were sent on a mission to Phoenix, Arizona to visit the people who were developing the 65C816, a successor to the 6502 with a 24-bit address extension. And we went to Phoenix expecting to find the usual American, you know, tall glass buildings, and glossy offices. And what we discovered was that uh, the Western Design Centre was working out of a bungalow in the suburbs, wow. um, hiring school children to design um, logic cells in their school holidays. And we came away from that visit thinking, well, if they can design a microprocessor, maybe we can too. And, and uh, we went back and uh, reported to Herman, and, and, and the ARM ideas were, were put on a sort of reasonably concrete and funded footing. Um, so... Uh, I don't think the ARM would have existed without the BBC Micro. Of course, ARM stood for Acorn Risk Machine in its earliest days. And I don't think we would have had the experience to design the processor in the way we did without the BBC Micro under our belts, as it were. Was the Archimedes like seen as a successor to the BBC Micro then? So it had the BBC branding on it first, didn't it? It did. Uh, yes, it was seen as a successor. Um, it was a rather complicated and messy story um, because at the outset, uh, Herman had um, hired Jim Mitchell on his way out of Xerox Park in California to set up the Acorn Research Center in Palo Alto. And, and they were co-developing um, a very advanced operating system in parallel with our development of the arm with the intention that the two should merge. But then with the financial difficulties in 84, Effectively, in the end, uh, the ARC's operating system work had to be abandoned. And, and to get an ARM-based product out, uh, a new operating system had to be put together. A much simpler operating system had to be put together in a big hurry. But the plan was um, to run BBC Basic, uh, to maintain compatibility, to have the red keys on there, 
and make it look like a, a proper successor to the BBC Micro. And, and it, it fitted into that slot quite nicely. It was an extremely powerful machine when it first came out. Well, what did you think of uh, the operating system RISCOS at the time? Well, when, when RISCOS finally emerged, I thought it was quite nice. I mean, the, um, the first operating system in 1987 was called Arthur. And, and, and that just about did the job. Um, but when RISCOS started coming together properly, then it was a real joy to use. Um, it was an unusual operating system. It was all coded in, in assembly language and it was stored in ROM. Uh, even then, most computers loaded their operating system from disk, and therefore they took a long time to start, whereas the Archimedes pretty much leapt into life. It was a window-based, window-mouse operating system, um, quite nice to use. The operating system philosophy was, was cooperative multitasking, so you had to write applications that would um, cede control uh, to any other applications wanting uh, to gain access to the machine at, at appropriate points. And cooperative multitasking, if done well, uh, can actually be more effective than standard preemptive multitasking. And so the Archimedes, I thought, worked um, really rather nicely. And it was quite a long time before you could get a standard PC with anything like such a fluid user interface. One thing about RISCOS I always remember is everything was middle click, wasn't it, which is very unusual today. Well, uh, yes, I mean, conventions as to which button does what yeah. were, were highly varied. I mean, you know, Apple uh, only had one button. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there was no confusion over left or right click with Apple. There's just one button and you click it. Um, everybody has kind of converged on, uh, on a similar convention now that, you know, left click is select, right click is something alternative and middle click, who knows. I mean, you know, the ARM processor obviously was designed for the desktop machine, the Archimedes. I mean, why was it made to be such a low power consumption device and if it was made for a desktop machine? The story there is that we were cost sensitive and uh, in order to keep the cost down, we needed the processor to go in a plastic package. And with a plastic package, uh, effectively, you have to work to about a one watt power limit. Now, the tools we had um, to estimate and predict the power of the chip uh, were, were rather crude at the time. So we applied Victorian engineering margins. And in order to, to be sure of coming in under a watt, we actually uh, missed the target by a factor 10 and came in under a tenth of a watt. Um, but it was really a combination of the fact that the processor is is firstly extremely simple. Secondly, it uses very few transistors. It, it, you know, there were some 8-bit processors that used more transistors than the ARM. And thirdly, as far as we could depend on the tools, uh, they led us to a very conservative uh, power position. As you mentioned before, you left Acorn in 1990. What was it that made you decide to leave at that point? It was becoming increasingly difficult to see how one could sustain the, the sort of investment needed to keep the processor competitive um, with state of the art in a company whose business was basically not growing. Also, the the management of, of Acorn, which in the early days had been very technical, Herman had been, uh, you know, with, uh, obviously Herman and Chris were joint managers, but Herman took most responsibility for the technical side, had been very technically involved. Um, in the later part of the 80s, after the financial troubles in, in 84, the company was increasingly run by uh, people with accounting backgrounds rather than engineering backgrounds. And it just become became very difficult to see how we were to do anything interesting with the processor in that environment. Of course, it, as it turned out, I must have left about two weeks before Apple came knocking at the door saying they wanted to use the arm in their Newton product and they, want, they didn't want it in Acorn. They wanted to set up a joint venture and and, and arm the company was formed only four months later or three months later. But there was no sign of that happening at the point where I decided to leave and revert to academia. Well, what did you think when the uh, Apple Newton came out and you saw it with the arm? Did you think, oh, this is a great product? Oh, maybe. I thought the Newton uh, was quite interesting. Um, it it was, was clearly not perfect. And, and, and things like the handwriting recognition didn't really work as well as it, as it had to. And the product was a bit bulky. But I, but I thought it was, it was a typical sort of Apple 
very ambitious product attempting to push to the next level of technology. And I think it was it was quite sad when it ultimately failed. Of course, it was 10 years later uh, that Apple came back again um, much more successfully. You know, 10 years later, the Newton became the iPhone mm. through the iPod um, and became a huge success. But I, 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 I quite liked the Newton. But in many ways, I was still more interested in the fate of ARM. And, and there's no doubt that the Apple brand and the Newton were vital to establishing ARM as an independent company. And by the time the Newton failed, Robin Saxby had found other lines of business, which meant that the company was uh, secure and growing. But in the early days of ARM, its role in the Newton was vital to ARM getting itself established. I mean, obviously, ARM went on to be a world leader and still is today. Um, it always felt a bit sad that it wasn't, you know, with Acorn really in the end. I mean, why do you think ARM was a success, but Acorn itself faded away? It almost seemed like the processor would have kept the brand and company alive somehow. Well, when you look at how ARM became a success, um, it was through becoming um, the main processor in a, in a completely different class of product from that for which it was originally developed. Acorn was a, a desktop personal computer company, and ARM's huge breakthrough was when they got the Nokia business in the mid-90s in, in the mobile phone. And, and you can see lots of Acorn influence. Um, Acorn got into trouble, um, ARM... Um, basically saw the way to develop its business globally uh, as a partnering um, model rather than a a single company setting up sales activities all around the world. I think, um, you know, could could Acorn have survived? Well, of course, the company is no more. But when it finally dissolved itself because it it realized that the, the value of the ARM shares it owned was greater than the stock market valuation of the entire company. Then bits of it joined Pace in the set-top box business and bits of it became Element 14, which was ultimately bought by Broadcom. And, and uh, you know, Sophie uh, was in that part and uh, developed the FirePath processor, which is at the um, exchange end of, of a lot of our DSL systems today. Mm-hmm. So nothing of Acorn actually sort of disappeared. It just went different directions and changed name. Well, do you see systems like the Raspberry Pi as kind of a modern version of the BBC Micro? I think the Raspberry Pi activity was very much motivated by similar forces, uh, but in a different era. Uh, so yes, I think the, the, the Raspberry Pi folk are quite explicit that uh, what they saw was that the effect the BBC Micro had in the 1980s had, had been lost in the 90s and education had, had become rather too much turned in towards use of machines rather than understanding and building them. Uh, but what was required in the 2000s was not another uh, set-top machine. It was, it was a different concept. And, of course, the Raspberry Pi has been hugely successful in fulfilling that role. And, and, and you find Raspberry Pi's all over the place now. Um, We work with with people who build robots that have Raspberry Pis inside. It's just such a convenient component for for controlling almost anything. Well, we mentioned the uh, Microman docudrama before. Um, It might be quite interesting to find out what you thought of it. Was it accurate to your memories? It was not um, totally accurate, of course. Uh, The the people responsible for it went around and, you know, bought lunch for me and talked to me and got anecdotes and I think they did the same with pretty much everybody they could find who was involved and of course the anecdotes they got were often mutually contradictory because uh, we all have our different recollections of the time with, with varying degrees of accuracy but I think most of the significant events they portray in the film happened in some form or other so they assembled the film from anecdotes I was particularly pleased that they, they found a good central theme, if you like, a storyline running through it of, 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 of the relationship between Clive Sinclair and, and Chris Curry. At the detail level, I, I was played by Sam Phillips and uh, to create the impression of a past era, uh, he was shown, I was shown chain smoking in the lab, which I never did. I haven't uh, smoked for a very long time. And, and uh, you know, 
I was shown wearing glasses um, with a beard. I've never had a beard. I didn't wear glasses till my late 40s with the usual um, eyesight issues that come at that age. Um, so a lot of the details were, were um, personally missed. I think probably the thing I was least happy with was being portrayed as chain smoking. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm, I'm fairly strongly anti-smoking. But, it, you know, that's a minor detail. It doesn't matter. The main thing is they found a good story. It portrays the era um, quite convincingly. And it's an interesting film to watch. Were you surprised at the retro community and kind of what they're doing with BBC Micros today? Um, I'm surprised that there are so many people doing it. I'm not surprised there are some. I mean, I think um, maintaining old machines and, 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 and keeping a bit of computing history alive is very important. I mean, I... I myself chaired the steering group for the Manchester Baby rebuild when it was uh, when Chris Burton led the reconstruction of the baby machine for the 50th anniversary in '98. Um, I think it's important that we do maintain the history of computing, even though the subject is so young. And it's very difficult because the hardware tends to die. And, and for a long time, I've thought one of the most promising routes to keeping. Um, the technology alive is is through software emulation because as the computers get so powerful so rapidly you can actually emulate older machines mm. on modern machines and the fact you lose an order of magnitude through the emulation um, you're still faster than the original machine in many cases uh, so I'm, I'm I'm a bit surprised that so many people seem to spend a lot of their time uh, maintaining ancient hardware though I'm very pleased that some of them do. And they make new stuff for it as well. I mean, I see loads of crazy add-ons on BBC Micros and stuff, which, you know, probably weren't, weren't possible when it was a current machine. Well, no, I mean, one, one retro event I went to in Huddersfield, um, somebody had integrated an SD card reader in, there, in a BBC Micro, mm-hmm. and a, a 256 megabyte SD card held every application ever written for the BBC Micro. <laughs> um, you know, when we used to have stacks of boxes of floppy disks, you could now get everything on a, on a tiny card. So, so um, yeah, and I can see it's interesting and fun. And it's also the case, actually, that if you get kids of the right age and sit them down in front of a, a, you know, a row of BBC Micros, they still seem to get a lot more out of it than they do if you sit them down in front of a row of today's PCs. Hmm. Um, I think it's because the BBC Micro and the computers of that era make you feel so much closer to the technology than a modern machine where you're, you know, you're looking through layer upon layer of, of, of software abstraction. Yeah, it's almost impossible to like, you know, bang the metal, as it were, on modern systems, isn't it? It is. And, and, and of course, that's one of the things that Raspberry Pi has tried to address. If I, if I were trying to build a little control system for... Uh, for you know some lab experiment or something I wanted to do at home, I don't think I'd start with an old BBC Micro though. I think I'd start with something like Raspberry Pi or PIC or Arduino. I, you know, I think uh, unless you're nostalgic for for the 80s, there aren't that many strong practical reasons for wanting to bring a beeb back to life. Well, today you're still working with ARM processors. Actually, um, over a million of them in the Spinnaker machine in Manchester. Tell us a bit about that project and where the idea came from. Spinnaker has its origins 20 years ago. In my first decade here at the university, I'd, I'd been involved in computing for um, over 20 years and computers had become a thousand times more powerful, but they still struggled to do things that, that humans and that other animals find easy. And, and I began to wonder what the difference was between what's happening in information processing in biology and information processing in machines. And so I thought it would be interesting to try and turn my computer engineering hand towards making a contribution to understanding how the brain works. That's that's really the origin of the project. And very early on, we set ourselves the goal of saying, what if we build a million processors into a single machine that can support integrated real-time models of bits of brain across the machine. Um, Even at the outset, it was clear that with a million processors, you're still at least two and probably three orders of magnitude away from a full human brain. Uh, But maybe you're in the region of a full mouse brain. And and so we set about working out how to build a real-time brain modeling system that was scalable. And and, uh, it started with the silicon design that took about five years and 40 man years to produce the chip. We got that in 2011, 
and since then we've been assembling it and scaling the machine up and we hit the million processors in November 2018 and we had a big party to celebrate although technically it wasn't that much of an advance because we'd had half a million for a couple of years and nobody quite worked out how to use all of them but um, yeah um, we have a big machine it's offering a service we have uh, you know order a hundred users around the world and there are about a hundred other spinnaker systems around the world as well so um, these are all in fairly specialist research lab use um, but at least the technology has found an interested audience um, amongst the right community. Well, Steve, obviously, you know, Acon's not around anymore, but the, the legacy is in, you know, projects like that and obviously the, the devices that we all have in our pocket today. So it's been incredible getting these stories. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing them with us. Very nice talking to you.